All right, so this morning's sermon, I kind of want to give um, an explanation on our soul winning here and, and what, what kind of what the church is all about is, is ultimately what, what I'm going to be explaining, why we do what we do, the, the methods that we use, and you know why we even exist here as a church in Prescott Valley. This is a question I've been asked multiple times from people. Usually when I'm out soul winning, I'm out knocking on people's doors. You know, why did you decide to start a church here? Why did you start a church in Prescott Valley? Because our church is a little less than three years old right now. We're coming up on our three-year anniversary in November. And so for the past three years, I've been going out and knocking on the doors in Prescott Valley. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the area, if you're visiting here, there's a lot of churches in town. There are a lot of churches in town. I tried last night to, to get some statistics. I don't know exactly how many there are, but when you drive around, there are churches all over the place. There's churches within the neighborhoods. There's churches just everywhere. So people say that if there's so many churches here, why do we think we need an another one? You know, what, what are you thinking? Well, before I moved up here, and, and it turns out to be very true, very accurate, I tried to do some research of finding a church that, you know, we're an independent fundamental Baptist church. So we, we believe the King James Bible is an inspired word of God. We believe salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we believe certain fundamentals of the faith, which, you know what, honestly, there's other churches in town that believe the same thing. But, you know, I tried to find a church that's actively going out and trying to preach the gospel to every creature and go and fill that great commission of Jesus Christ, and I found zero. I found zero. Now... I understand that not everybody puts everything on the internet. You know, there's churches that exist. And I was thinking, well, maybe there's another church out here. But in the three years that I've been here, I have not found one other church that preaches the correct gospel that goes out and actually preaches the gospel in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Now, there are churches that go out, and I've seen some door hangers, you know, some, some flyers. And I've seen other, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses preach a false works-based salvation. Um, Mormons will do it. I haven't seen any here that are actively going out and, and trying to evangelize. And then I believe the Potter's House also goes out and talks to people, but they have a completely works-based salvation that uh, they believe you can lose your salvation and, and many other things. So those are the only churches I found even doing anything in this area when it comes to you know, evangelism, when it comes to going out and preaching the gospel. So that is why I started this church in this town. And I want to point out something here in Luke chapter 13 because most young believers, most people who, who are actually saved, who you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't have a whole lot of knowledge, have a tendency to think that anybody that calls themselves a Christian is saved. Amen. This is the mentality that I had when I was, when, right after I got saved. It was, it, was, it was cool. I got saved when I was 20 years old, and, and I was, I'm not sure exactly who was responsible for planting the seeds and watering the seeds, you know, but, but I got saved in my bedroom. I called on the Lord. I called on Jesus Christ to save me. I knew I couldn't do it myself. I put all my faith in Him. Now, did I understand all the doctrines of everything in the Bible? No, of course not. I was a newborn babe in Christ. There's all kinds of things I didn't understand, but I knew I was saved. I knew that it was nothing to do with me. I knew that Christ did everything for me, and I was completely resting in Him for my salvation. I knew that much. Okay, I probably couldn't even put it that eloquently to you, but, but that's what I believed. That's what I knew in my heart, and from that moment forward, I knew I was saved. And it's almost like I was thinking, hey, I'm a Christian now. And I was, you know, like, like now I get it. Now I understand, you know, I was, I was raised a Christian. I was raised in the Presbyterian church, but I never understood it. I never got it. It was never my religion. It's not what I believe. You know, it was just whatever. But now I was like, oh, cool, I'm a Christian. And I thought, oh, you run into religious people, people who are really into their religion, and they're called Christians, that they're saved too. Right? I'm thinking, well, we all believe in Jesus. I mean, I don't know what all these different denominations are about. I know people believe different things, and, you know, they have different doctrines and stuff. But... Anybody that calls themselves a Christian is saved, right? No. And that's not true. It's actually far from the truth. And this is something that one of the very important things that we need to realize, because a lot of people will think that there's not that much of a need. I mean, hey, look at Prescott Valley. Look at all these churches in town. They're all Christian churches. It's not like we have mosques or, or you know, Buddhist temples or you know, all these other things. That's, you know, they're all Christian churches, so why would we even need to go out and preach the gospel? I mean, everyone's a Christian, right? No. Not true. Look, look at what the disciples asked Jesus Christ here in Luke 13. Look at verse number 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few 
that be saved? It's a good question. Are there few people that are saved? Look at what his answer is. Verse 24, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be, be able. So when they ask the other few that are saved, he doesn't say yes or no, but he says there's many that are not. So few and many, right? If there's many that are not, what does that mean? Yes, there's few that actually are saved. Many is the majority, few is going to be the, the minority there. And keep your finger here in Luke 13 because I want to make one more point out of this chapter. Flip back, though, to Matthew chapter 7. Now, don't get confused because a lot of people turn to verses like this until they see, see, strive to enter in at the straight gate. And they'll try to teach a works-based salvation. And they'll say, see, the reason why there's few that are saved is because no one's actually doing the work. Because no one's actually going out and, you know, and following Jesus and, be, you know, and doing everything that he said to do. And they'll say, see, the, 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 straight, the gate is straight. It's real narrow. And you can't go to the left hand or the right hand by sinning. That's what they'll teach. Mm -hmm. But that's a false doctrine. That's a, that's a, that's not what the Bible's saying here at all. That's right. Now, when it says the gate is straight, it is straight. That means narrow. And the reason why the way to heaven is narrow is because there's only one way. Amen. And that's through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. Amen. It's not through Buddha. It's not through your works. It's not through some religion. It's not through some church. It's through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. It's, you know, the way under destruction, you know, there's many ways there. Because it's basically every way that's not through Jesus Christ. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13. The Bible reads, Enter ye in at the straight gate. So again, saying the same thing. Enter at the straight gate, that narrow gate. Why? For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There's the answer to that question right there, spelled out plainly in black and white. Few there be that find it. There are few people that are saved. And you know what? There's a lot fewer, there's a lot less people that are saved when nobody's going out and preaching the gospel. There's already few people that are saved. And when nobody's going out and preaching the gospel, guess what? No one's getting saved. Right. Flip back, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. I'm, I'm going to go through in this sermon the, the who, what, why, when, and where, not necessarily in that order, of the soul winning program that we do here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. So the first question is why? Why do we do this? Well, one, because no one else is doing it in this town. That's why this church got started. Two, hell is a real place. That's right. Jesus taught about hell. Hell is a place that every unbeliever is going to go to when they die. Hell is a place of eternal burning, torture, and torment. And look, it's easy to hear that. It's easy to understand that. But don't ever let that reality slip your mind. It is a big motivating factor for you to take the time out of your day. Say, it's Sunday. I like to spend time with my family. Oh, it's Wednesday. Oh, it's, it's Monday. It's Tuesday. Whatever. Whatever the day is. But Saturday, I want to go enjoy myself. I want to go out and be entertained. I want to go out and have fun. But hell is a real place. And you could spend all of your time doing everything else in the world and say, well, I don't really want to go out so anyway. Well, I don't really want to preach the gospel. But you deciding to do that, if your gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. When you decide not to preach the gospel, there's, there's consequences for that. Hey, maybe you could have a fun time. Maybe you could enjoy the day. Hey, it's a beautiful day out today. And, and yeah, you could just, just have some pleasures for a little while on this earth. But other people are dying and going to hell. Right. And hell is literal. And people are actually literally dying every single day and their souls are going into hell. And if you care about other people at all, you should care about, about I mean, that's, that's a, that's a place where, you know, you don't wish your worst enemy to go to just because when you, when you actually realize how permanent, forever, horrible, torturous that place is, that is a motiv big motivating factor to go out and say, you know what, I can skip the lake for a day. I could skip whatever the, you know, the entertainment is and do a little bit of work. I could go out and, and care enough about people because I do believe there's a real place and try to show people how they could avoid that. And know that there's only one way. And many people are deceived. But another reason, another why, why and there's, there's many, I could spend an entire sermon on why. There is 
plenty, so I'm not going to hit all of them by any means. But in Luke 13, I just wanted to point this out real briefly. Look at verse number 6, because this is a parable, but we're, we're taught that we ought to be fruitful. And this is going to, I want you to keep this in mind, because we're going to go to another passage, excuse me, in a little bit. We're going to go over the parable of the sower, and this will come into play when we read that passage also. Okay, but look at verse number 6. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now, we are taught as Christians to be fruitful. And what it means to be fruitful is to be reproductive. You're reproducing. You're bringing forth after your own kind. It's taught all the way back in Genesis that the, the trees brought fruit, fruit after, forth after their own kind. Everything in this earth brings forth after its own kind. When you look at an orange tree, it's only going to produce oranges. It can't produce apples. It's not going to produce any other type of fruit. It's going to keep producing after its own kind. And when you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, when you're a saved Christian, you know what your fruit is? You're going to be bringing forth after your own kind, bringing forth other believers on Jesus Christ, going out, preaching the gospel, and reproducing yourself in them. Amen. That is the fruit that we need to be seeking. And what we're seeing here in this parable is say, hey, I've got this tree here. I've got a fig tree. And the reason why I have a fig tree is because I want to eat the figs off of it, right? So if I have a fig tree, and the purpose of that fig tree is because I want to eat the figs off of it, and it's not bringing any figs at all, why am I going to waste the space, waste the resources, waste the watering, waste the, just, just everything by having this there, and it's not doing anything for me? I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm going to replace it with something that will, that will produce fruit. That's the concept that's being taught here, and we need to keep this in mind. Look, as a Christian, we need to be fruitful. God is working with us. God wants us to be fruitful. God, God's working in your life, and he's saying, you know, essentially, we need to be concerned and just, just thinking about that. If we're not doing anything for God, it's kind of like, well, what, what are we here for? Right. We all have a purpose on this earth. We need to be, you know, preachers of the word. He's, he's given us this duty, this responsibility to be ambassadors for Christ. There's a lot of work to be done. And God's up in heaven expecting us. Because look, God doesn't just speak to people individually just saying, you know, I, my son paid for your sins and, and, you know, and preach the gospel to every individual person on this earth. He doesn't do it. It's not being done that way. He doesn't approach people in a dream and tell them about salvation. He doesn't, you know... Um, there's not like every day people are having this experience of, of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus where Jesus is like speaking to him audibly. Okay, that doesn't happen. That was a one-time event. Right. And besides that, he was preached the gospel by Ananias anyways later because he was still blind after even Jesus met him in the way. He finally received his sight when he called on the name of the Lord and he got baptized. <clears throat> and no, baptism doesn't save don't misunderstand what I'm saying there. But um, we need to, to make sure that we're going to be, and God can look down at us and say, okay, you're doing the work that I have for you and, and not just take away. I mean, you could take away our life. Just say, you're not, you're not doing what I told you to do. You're not bearing any fruit. Why do you cumber the ground? And he'll just, he can just take you home early. But uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28. So those are some of the reasons why. But how? How do, we, how do we accomplish this? And we're going to see in Matthew 28, of course, at the end of the chapter, is, is that what's known as the Great Commission. It's what Jesus Christ, you know, his, his departing words, essentially, for, for his disciples and for the believers to, to, to do. It's the last chapter in Matthew, and the last verse is there. The Bible reads in verse number 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I want to point out those first three words in verse 19. Go ye therefore. Go. 
Those are the imperative words that he says we need to We need to go and teach all nations. Go and baptize them. Go and make disciples of them. Go and teach them to do all these things. Go. Amen. And what we have backwards, turn if you would to John chapter 4. Churches have this backwards these days. And we're going, to some, you know, we're going into details on how we do the soul winning. And a lot of churches these days are designing their church service to bring the lost into church. They're saying, we need to reach more people. We need to fill up this church. We need to get the lost into church so we can get them saved and, and fulfill the Great Commission. But right off the bat, you missed the first word. Go. He didn't say make a marketing campaign to draw them in. He didn't say to, to start altering the church service in order to be attractive to the unsaved crowd. But that's exactly what's happening. See, it, it didn't start that way, but when you start looking at these churches and, and you say, how in the world is this happening? You look at a church that's got the, 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 the big rock band on stage and they've got all the lighting and maybe even pyrotechnics and you're saying, how did church go from sitting in a room, reading our Bibles and singing congregational hymns to this entertainment? How could that even happen? It happens slowly. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens with a, with a flawed mentality. It happens with, with, with this idea or this notion that, hey, and, and you know, I've heard this by a lot of people, even in town here. There's a lot of churches that are dying in town. Some of the better churches. Churches where there's still people that are saved attending. People who, who believe the right gospel. But they've been misguided. And they're thinking, you know, our church is just full of really old people. We have no young people coming to our church. Why is that? And say, how are we going to reach these young people? And they have this dilemma and they say, what are we going to do? And that's when they start thinking, well, in order to reach young people these days, because they have this notion that somehow today, young people are different than they ever have been throughout history, that all of a sudden it's this brand new problem. And in order to get anyone to listen to us, if we want to get a young person to listen to us, well, we, what type of music do they listen to? Well, let's just bring that in. Well, let's add Jesus to it. And now all of a sudden, you know, it, it'll, it will get the, the young people to come in. And, and they start making compromise on issues and approaching it completely the wrong way. Right. You know how you're going to reach the young people? With the truth. Amen. The truth of the gospel. Look, God's word hasn't changed. Amen. You can say a culture changes, but God's word doesn't change. People get saved the same way today as they've always gotten saved. Amen. Through the word of Jesus Christ. Through his gospel. That's what they need. And how about this? You want to bring young people in? Why don't we go out and try to, and try to win parents to Christ and get people to start raising their children right again and, and approach that problem? Because what it is is this, this mentality also of this, you know, what, what is church about anyways? People have this notion that church is all about me. Hey, what can I get from your church? Hey, what do you have for me? What programs do you have for me? What do you have going on? Hey, me, 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 me. Is that what church is all supposed to be about? No. We're supposed to edify other people. I mean, we're supposed to see what can we do for God? What can I do for the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to serve Him. I want to sing praises to Him. But it's turned into, oh, let's have, you know, sister so-and-so come up here and, and, and sing so everyone could ooh and ah over how great she is. And where does the glory go? It's not going to God. Now, I'm not completely against people that, that have talent, musical talent, singing you know, to God, but let's not turn church service into entertainment to where everyone's just sitting back and watching this person up here you know, sing unto God. That's not what it's about. We're supposed to be singing to ourselves with psalms and hymns and, sp hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, <clears throat> which is why we do the congregational singing here. But churches have this backward. They're, they're so focused on bringing lost people to church, but that's not even what church is about. Did I have you turn to John 4? All right, as long as you're there, let's look at, look at what he says here because look at verse number 35. Jesus says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying, true, one soweth and another reapeth. Look at what he says in verse 38. I sent you to reap 
that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye, enter, ye are entered into their labors. Jesus Christ is sending people to reap. When you, you, when, you, when you reap in a field, you have to go out to the field and do the reaping out there. You don't bring... You, there's no way to bring everything into the storehouse and do the reaping in the storehouse. We don't bring... You know, we, we want to bring the sheaves into church, but you, first you have to go out and do the reaping because the whole point of church is, is, is based for the believer. It's supposed to be a body, a congregation of people who already believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the church is, is by definition. That's what the biblical definition of the church is. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. We'll show you this. Now, we will have unbelievers in church from time to time. It's going to happen, and that's fine. You know what? I don't have a problem with that, but that's not what the church service is geared towards. We're not trying to just draw as many unsaved people as possible into this church. We're here to sing praises to God. We're here to learn from Scripture. And see, you know, the Bible says that the, that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. That the natural man, the unsaved, the unregenerate man, the Bible is going to be foolishness to him. He's not going to understand it. The, the Bible is a spiritual book and it's spiritually discerned. So the preaching of God's word to the unsaved person, they're not going to know what's going on. I was talking to another guy out soul winning. He's like, when you go to church, he's like, I just don't understand anything. It's because you're not saved. Or you're not going to a good church, you know, I mean, either way, but, or both. But you need to be saved in order to receive the things of God. And <clears throat> if we geared our church service towards the unsaved, we'd have to just be preaching the gospel every week. I mean, yeah, because no one's going to get it. And then what does that do? Well, you've got people who are believers already coming in and just hearing the gospel every week, not growing at all because, you know, when you hear the gospel 20 times as a believer, yeah, I know this already. Can we get into something else? So, you, so you're stunting the growth of those who are already saved, and now you're just preaching the gospel every week after week to people who are lost when that's not what church is for. We're supposed to go out and do that. We are supposed to preach the gospel, but we're supposed to go out and do that. And that's everybody's job, not just the pastor's job. That's right. Every believer. Amen. But look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to see a good example of this when, when so many people were saved on the day of Pentecost. Look at verse number 41. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So people got saved because they received the word. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This is talking about people who received the word, people who put their faith on Christ were added to who? Added to the other believers, added to the other disciples, added to people who were already believers. So you got a group of believers, you got a congregation of believers, and added unto them were more believers. And that's how the church grew. And we're going to continue reading here, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Again, there's a reference to the church. That's all that believed. They're all the believers were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved the church was grown the church was added to by adding believers that is how the church grows. That is, that is what the church is for. The church is for the believers to receive edification, to receive the teaching, to receive the training. It's not for the lost. <clears throat> God's word has not lost its power. We don't need to reach the young people by, by appealing to the flesh, by appealing to just the things of this world that they like. Amen. And you know what? It's not going to do them any good either. It, since when in the Bible? Show me a time where it says to be deceptive on, on trying to get people saved. Yes, sir. Yeah. It never says that one time. No. We just bring the truth. We're shining a light. We're not, we're not beguiling people. 
You know, the false prophets are the one that beguile the unstable souls. That's right. We're actually bringing the truth. And the truth is what it is. And hey, it's up to the person to either accept or reject it. But it's not up to us to determine, oh, well, we need to make this easier for someone to, 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 to swallow or easier to understand. No. We're, we're, I'm not going to sugarcoat God's word. Because in so doing, and I've mentioned this in the past, but, but it needs to be reiterated. You know, when, when we think that we can make God's word somehow more palatable, we're in a, in a sense, we're judging God's word for what it says and say, well, what, is it, what his word says isn't good enough, so I need to, like, make it so that you can, you know, and usually what happens is people end up twisting it to make it sound nicer maybe than it really is in some instances, right? When the word says what it says. It is what it is, and I think it's great. Amen. And, any, and any tampering by me is just going to pervert it and, and make it less great and make it a lie. But uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. Because not only do, do a lot of churches, and, and you know, we started here to, to be a soul-winning church. How are we going to do that? Well, let's look at a biblical model. How, how we're not going to do it is by changing our church to gear it for unsaved people. But how we are going to do it is we're going to go out. We're going to bring the gospel to the unbeliever and then get them into church. Then start discipling them. Then get them baptized. Then do all these other things. But another technique that a lot of people are doing, and, and I don't think this is scriptural either. And again, everything I say, if you say, well, no, no, that is a scriptural method. I'll just challenge you. Show me in the Bible where it says this. And if you disagree with one of my points, then come to me after the service and show me in the Bible. I, you know, I'm willing to listen to what the Bible has to say. I'm willing to be corrected by the Bible anytime. But it has to be in the Bible. That's right. Not just an opinion. Right. Okay, if you want to prove something to me, show me what the Bible says. Tracts, gospel tracts are not good enough. That is not what we're commanded to do. We're not commanded to go out and hand people a piece of paper and call that preaching gospel. Now, you want to hand out gospel tracts, go ahead and do it. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm not saying anything like that. But that's not preaching the gospel. We have a gospel tract on our invitation on the back. It's got the Bible way to heaven, and we list all these different verses and all these different things. Hopefully someone can read that, but you know what? That's still not preaching the gospel. Preaching gospel is preaching gospel. It's preaching. Because then, I mean, if, it was just, if our job was just to hand printed material to people, then why not just hand them Bibles? Right. And just expect people to get saved. Just, here's God's word. Here you go. We're going to see why that method doesn't work. And look, I'm not against handing out Bibles. I'm not against it. But that is not fulfilling the great commission of preaching the gospel to every creature. It's not, it's not what we're called to do. That's right. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse number 26. We're going to see the, the famous story of Philip and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch. We're going to see why. Why do we not just hand out Bible? Why do we not just hand out gospel tracts? Look at Acts 8, verse 26. The Bible reads, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that thou goest down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. So here, think about this story, okay? Here's this eunuch. He's, he just is coming back from Jerusalem. Why was he at Jerusalem? To worship. He's a Christian, right? He's a, he's a Jew. He's, 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 he's a, he, you, know, you look at him and say, well, he's a believer. He's reading the Bible and he's on his way back from Jerusalem. We don't need to preach the gospel to that person. The Holy Spirit told Philip to go over there and talk to him. Look at this. Look, keep reading here. Just so you understand the story, I mean, where he's coming from. He's coming from worshiping. He's reading his Bible. Most people will look at someone like that and be like, they're saved. This Ethiopian eunuch was not saved. Let's keep reading here. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran. And look at that. The Spirit told Philip to go... And what did he do? Did he hem and haw about it? Did he say, well, no, I got some other things to do? No, he ran. Amen. He ran straight to that work. Amen. You say, there's a person right there. All right, I'm going. He's excited about it. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? 
Do you know what you're reading? Do you understand that? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So he's saying, I don't know what this is saying. Can you, can you help? Can you point it out to me? Can you show it to me? The place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. What a great passage on Jesus Christ. I mean, if ever there's an Old Testament scripture to kind of look to to provide an answer of salvation, this is a great verse. But he didn't get it at all. You say, well, he had a Bible. He's reading God's word. He needs someone to show him. He needs someone to preach to him. He needs someone to explain it. It's not enough just to hand someone a Bible, to hand someone a piece of paper. It needs to be explained. The Holy Spirit needs to be working there through a workman, through someone who God has ordained to go out and do this. And he's ordained, look, he's ordained everyone who's believers to go out and preach the gospel. Look at verse number 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and, say, I, and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth. Now is where the preaching of the gospel starts. Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Right. He's preaching the gospel to him. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And if you're reading an NIV or any of these modern translations, verse 37 is not there at all. He, re he asks the question and it goes straight into the baptism. Which is one of the reasons why we're King James only church because... This is actually a critical verse That's right. that needs to be in the Scripture. And it's been removed from the modern translation. But look at verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. After the preaching of Philip. That's what he believed. And he wanted to get baptized and he got baptized. And that's the biblical baptism. And that is the scriptural method of somebody getting saved. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Preaching the gospel. Because it's not handing out tracts. It's not getting people to ask about our life and about why is your life so different. But boldly preaching the gospel. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Another thing that we try to do here as a church is we try to do everything the way that we find it in Scripture. The methods that we do things. Now, there may be some extra things that, that are done, like we do print out invitations. Okay? We do have little pens. We do have some, some DVD material. We do have some of these other things. But, and I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm not saying you can't do some other, you know, some extra things, some other stuff, but when it comes down to it, we have to be following the, the, the methods and the practice that we find in Scripture first and foremost. This is the template. This is the mold. You know, we can add a few things to this here and there, especially and, and only if they don't contradict what we're seeing here. But we never, never, never want to replace what we're seeing here with these other ideas and these other things and these other videos and these other, you know, whatever. You want to add to that a little bit here and there and, and you know, the message is good. And you know, I'm not against it. We hand out DVDs. We hand out information. We hand out other leaflets. But this is primary. This is the goal. And this is what we can never lose focus of. And everything that we are doing here ought to line up 100% with what God's Word says. Look at Romans chapter 10. We're going to read this whole chapter. Because this whole chapter is great. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So we're starting this chapter right off with a soul winning just, just desire. Apostle Paul saying, look, I want Israel to be saved. 
I want these people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number two. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And honestly, this is how a lot of unbelievers are. They go about and establish their own righteousness. They're righteous in their own eyes for different reasons. And most of the people think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty good. I haven't hurt anybody. So they, they establish their own righteousness, their own set of rules. Well, I'm going to heaven because I've never killed somebody. I'm going to heaven, I mean, I've never been to prison. I've never hurt anybody that bad. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but you know, God's a loving God and he's merciful. And they just establish their own rules for righteousness instead of looking to God's word for the righteousness. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You want to try to follow God's law for your righteousness to be saved? Good luck with that. Because nobody's been able to do that ever except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The, the standard of keeping God's law for righteousness when you have Christ, that's not the standard because Christ is your Savior. He's the one who has paid for all of your sins and He's the one that provides the righteousness to you. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is one of the things that we do when we go into how, how we preach the gospel, or why do we do certain things. When we go out and preach the gospel, yes, we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach that people are sinners. We preach that there's a judgment. We preach that God is a judge. We preach that people who, who are unbelieving and, and have committed sins, they deserve this punishment of hell. We preach that God is a loving God. We preach that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again after three days and three nights. We preach that God loves you and he did all this for you and he, he's a propitiation for your sins. And we preach that all you have to do to be saved is to put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Amen. That's what the gospel, that's what the Bible says. That's what God's word says. That's what we believe. But when we're done talking to people and we preach that it's everlasting life, we preach that when the Bible says it's eternal life, that it really means it's eternal life. It lasts forever. You know what that means? You can't lose it. Amen. It's eternal life. It's not temporary life. And we get, and that's one of the hardest things that people don't realize because they still kind of want to cling to works in some way, shape, or form of just saying, well, no, then that means I can still sin and go to heaven. Yes, that's what that means. Because it's a free gift. Because it's eternal life. That's what you receive. It's a great news. That's the gospel. But when we read here, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and this deserves its own sermon, but when, when, you know, when we, we preach the gospel to people, we also lead them in a prayer, helping them to call on the name of the Lord to receive their salvation, to put their faith in Jesus Christ and just to audibly express that and call on God. All throughout time, going back to Genesis, this is, you know, then, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord very early on in, in human history. People have always called on the name of the Lord at the time of their salvation. I called on the name of the Lord when I got saved. You know what? I didn't have someone to lead me in prayer. I was all by myself. No one even said to me, hey, pray to God and call on Him to save you. I did it. Because it's a natural thing to do when you realize you're lost and you realize you need a Savior. Hey, God, save me. Whosoever shall call upon you. But you need to have the faith. 
It's vain words if, you, if it's just a prayer. You know, we, we don't do one, two, three, repeat after me. Right. We're very thorough in, in, in presenting the gospel to people. But at the same time, we do, we do help people to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. We make sure that they understand the gospel. We make sure that everything is, is preached and that they understand it's eternal life. They understand the freeness of the gift. They understand the gospel. They understand what Jesus Christ did for them and how he paid for everything. But then we also will lead them in a prayer. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, look at this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So he's saying it's impossible to call on him legitimately, right? And, and, and to call that, calling on the name of the Lord, if you haven't even believed on him. And how shall they believe in him, look at this, of whom they have not heard? You've got to hear about it in order to believe on it. You can't believe in something you've never heard about. It's impossible because you've never heard about it. You don't know what it is. You can't believe on something that, that like to the unknown God like, the, like they had in, in, in Rome, Right? The unknown God. Yeah, you're just believing something you don't even know about. You can't do that. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You need a preacher. What does a preacher do? He preaches. It doesn't say, and how shall they hear without a publisher? Like Thomas Nelson or Zondervan. It's how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? People need to be sent. You, that's why you need to be in a good church that's sending you out soul winning because if you're not being sent, you're not going to do it. You may do it a little bit here and there for a little while, but when you're not being sent, you're not going to do it. As it is written, how beautiful are the bindings of the pamphlets. Oh, wait, no. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The feet. Why? Because the feet go. The feet bring the good news, bring the gospel to the lost. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Two very important aspects of people getting saved there. Faith cometh by hearing, because someone's preaching it to them. And that hearing is by the word of God. Another mistake that people will make is think that they could explain the gospel completely in their own words yeah. and that people are going to get saved that way by just a, just a total explanation of, of Jesus dying for their sins. The power is in God's word. Amen. The hearing is by the word of God, which is why when you see it, if you've seen us out so when we bring our Bibles with us or it's up here, right? I mean, it, but, it, but we bring the book with us to show people the word to, to use the word because that is where the power is coming from. I'm going to finish off this chapter. He says in verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Look at this. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But it is really said, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Isaiah is very bold. He says, I was found of them that sought me not. They weren't looking for him, but you know what? He found them out. The people at the, whose doors we knock, the people who we talk to about the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not looking for us. They're not looking for Jesus. They're not looking to get in a conversation about God. But you know what? If you're bold, you're going to go out and you're going to, and you're going to preach to them anyways. You're going to find them and make sure that they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's our job to do. Because if you just wait for people to come to church, do you know how many people will never come to this church? The vast majority. There's people, there's some people that can't even get out of their house. They're shut-ins. And they're not saved. How are they going to hear the gospel? You can't wait for them to come in and come to you. We have to be bold and bring the gospel to them. Amen. That's what we're called. That's what the Bible teaches. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 8. As I was mentioning, you know, the Bible said in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're going to look at the parable of the sower now. 
Just to, to prove this more fully of how God's Word is necessary and critical for salvation. And also keep in mind, too, when we're reading about the, the fig tree bearing fruit also, it, it kind of plays into this a little bit as well. Luke chapter 8, we're going to read the parable and the explanation starting in verse number 4. Luke 8, 4, and when, the people, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his field, his seed, excuse me. So went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? So what does this mean? What are you talking about? And if someone goes out to sow, yeah, some of them fall on the rock, some of them fall on good ground, some of them, you know, what, what are you talking about? He's going to explain himself here. Look at verse number 10 and said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that they seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So in this parable, let's keep that straight. When he's talking about sowing the seed, which he's throwing the seed around and trying, trying to get things to grow, the seed is the word of God that he's, that he's throwing out there. Amen. It's God's word that's going to bring the life. Verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear. So he's, he's throwing the word out. They hear it. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. This is the explanation. This is no longer the parable. So the word is being sown into their hearts. What word? God's word. The word of God is sown in their hearts. And look at what it says here. The devil comes and takes it away. So before people actually believe that word, the devil's out there trying to remove that word from people's hearts so that they can't get saved. Very clear. Unless they believe and be saved. Hey, that's because that's all they have to do. Once the word is sown in their heart, they just have to believe it. They just receive it. They put their faith on that word and they're saved. And it's done and it's good. People teach this parable wrong so many times because they'll say that the only person who's saved is the one who's bringing forth fruit. And that is false. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So not only do they hear it. See, that first group, they heard it, but they didn't receive it. They heard it, they didn't believe it. This second group, they heard the word, and they received it with joy. Hey, great news, right? It's good news of the gospel. They received it. They believed it. And these have no root, which for a while... Look at the word, believe. They do believe. And in time of temptation, fall away. This is someone who gets saved because they put their faith on the word of God, but they get tempted, other things come up, and they get out because they have no root, because they never really got rooted down in the word, in church, in a good place to, to, to be strong. Because let's face it, there are a lot, of, a lot of heavy temptations in this world. And if you're not really fully rooted and grounded, you're going to be swayed all over the place. This is a fact. I was for many years after I was saved. I was tossed all about and I had the temptations of this world and I loved the pleasures of sin for a season and I liked all that stuff. And it wasn't until I finally got planted in a good church where then I finally started being more rigid and more, more firm in, con, you know, in, my, in my convictions and in my beliefs and saying, no, I'm not going to do these things. No, I'm going to get this sin out of my life. No, I don't want any of this stuff because now I'm more firmly planted. But for a long time, I wasn't. And, and many people are like this. But it doesn't make them not saved. It doesn't mean they never received the word. Verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. They get distracted with all these other things. And think about that, that fig tree. Now, did that fig tree that wasn't bearing figs, 
Was that somehow not a fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit? No. Of course it was. That grew from the seed. The seed was planted. The seed brought forth life of the fig tree, but that fig tree didn't bear other fruit. The tree was still a fig tree. The person who's born again believer, someone who gets saved and they put their faith on the seed, the word of God that was sown in their hearts, they're still a believer. They're still born again. They're still a child of God. Whether or not they bring forth fruit. Now, should they be bringing forth fruit? Of course they should. But some people get distracted with the riches and pleasures of this life and they don't end up bringing forth fruit. Verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, with, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. We have a light. If you're born again, you've got the light. You've got the, the light of the gospel inside of you. You've got the word of God that has taken root and has taken that, 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 is, that has brought forth the life when you were born again. And we need to shine that. We don't need to hide under a bushel. We need to be shining that light everywhere in every which way. I'm going to answer the, the last couple of uh, you know, the who, the when, and the where real briefly here. The how. How do we do it? We're sent. How do we do it? We bring our Bible. We bring the Word of God. We use the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, so we're preaching it, and we're preaching the Word of God. That is how we preach the Gospel. Now look, there are many ways to preach the Gospel to people. We don't just subscribe to one way. You have to use this verse, this verse, this verse. No. You, but make sure you're using the Word. Make sure you're using God's Word. And we have special times where we have it set that we are going to go out and preach the gospel. And I think that we all should be participating in that. But that shouldn't be your only soul winning. You should also be talking to people on the job. You should also be talking to people that come in your house. You should also be talking to people that you have daily just occurrences with throughout your day, throughout your life. Just people you come into contact with. That should also be part of your preaching the gospel to people. I think it should be all-encompassing. Hey, the more ways you have to, to reach people and get a hold of people, great, amen, let's keep doing that. It's not just about our published times, but these times are here so that we make sure we are following Christ, that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we're, we're actively going out to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So where are we doing this? Well, in Acts 5.42, you don't have to turn, the Bible says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So we go out to every house. Jesus sent them out two and two. The Bible says uh, in Luke 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We are his laborers. Jesus sent them out two and two and you know what? That's what we do here. I send people out two and two. Now, sometimes we have an odd number, so there's someone left alone. It's usually me. But, you know, we, by and large, our, our standard here is we send people out two and two, and we go to every house. That's the way we do it. Why? Because we find Scripture to, to, to kind of support that. Because we're trying to do things the way that, with the examples that we have set forth in the Bible. And when... Do we do these things? Well, the Bible said daily in the temple and in every house. So it's, it's, it's something that ought to be done every day. Now, we're a small church. We have now three published soul winning times. But again, besides those times, we should be, be active in our, in our daily life trying to preach the gospel to people. It's something that, that is not just for a soul winning time. It's not just for, for when you come to church, especially. It's not just for any one time. It should be all the time. It should be in our hearts all the time. And then who? Who should be doing this? All who are saved. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 4. It's the last place we're turning. We're almost done. John chapter 4. I just want to point this out because... Everybody, once you're saved, you ought to be a soul winner. 
You ought to be learning how to do it. You ought to be trying to bring people to Christ. I remember the day after I got saved, I tried explaining it to my, to my roommates. I had three, I lived in an apartment, four bedroom apartment, and, and I lived with three other guys at college. And I was trying the best I could to explain to them, hey, I, I got saved last night. They're like, what are you talking about? And it kind of just like made fun of me, you know, like, like whatever, you didn't know what he's talking about. And I wasn't very, you know, I wasn't doing a very good job explaining. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, but I know that I'm saved. I, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. And, you know, they gave you a hard time about it or whatever. But that's the time, you know, it, it's exciting to get saved. It should be exciting. I mean, it, it should be a moment where you've had in your life where you've actually put your faith in Christ. Where you've called on the Lord and you know that now you're saved because before you weren't and now you are. Now, some people get emotional. Some people have tears. Some people have other, you know, other experiences. And I'm not saying if you don't have some extremely emotional event and that means you're not saved. No. It doesn't mean you're not saved. But you ought to be able to know there was a time that you, act, that you made the decision to call on Jesus Christ to save you. That should happen. Because otherwise, I would start to then wonder, did, you know, did you really get saved and when did you? Because it's a lot of people, I've heard people say, like, well, I've always been saved. Well, no, you haven't. Nobody's always been saved. Except for Jesus Christ. But look at John chapter 4. Because, you know, there's no classes required. I like to provide, sometimes I've provided soul winning workshops. I'll provide helps. I'll try to help you in any way that I can to equip you the best as possible to get you be effective in preaching the gospel to every creature. But it's not a requirement to have to go through some class, to go through some long thing, to be studied and looked at before you can be sent out to go preach the gospel. Everybody ought to be doing it from day one. Look at John chapter 4, verse 25. We're going to see the story of the woman at the well. Jesus is talking to her. He's preaching unto her. And, and you know, we're not going to go through the whole story, but look at verse 25. It says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he lays it out on her. He said, Well, I am the Christ. Verse 27, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Look at this. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So the first thing that she does is she tries telling other people about Christ and leading them to him. Hey, look at this guy over here. Isn't this Christ? This is the Christ here. And many people believe because, the Bible says that because of the sayings of her. Now, some people had to go and, and, and see for themselves. And they needed a little bit more evidence. They needed to hear it again. They needed to hear it maybe from somebody else. But she went right away and started pointing people to Jesus. Just like Andrew went and found Simon Peter, his brother. And he says, hey, Christ is here. First thing he did, he found his brother, brought him to Christ. That's the way that we ought to be. When, when someone gets saved, you don't, you don't have to have some time period go by. You don't have to make sure you read enough of your Bible. Look, if you got saved, you know how you got saved. I knew how I got saved. Now, I wasn't very good at being able to explain it to other people. But it's something that I should be doing. I didn't, I didn't know a lot on, on, on being effective. I didn't know a lot about you know, even using God's Word. Someone, you know, the Word had been sown in my heart because otherwise I wouldn't be saved. It had to have happened. I don't know specifically who did it, but it definitely was sown in my heart. We need to be able to do the same thing and, and receive the instruction, try to get better at it, but everybody ought to be participating in soul winning and in preaching the gospel and that's what our church is all about that's why we're here that is the main objective yes are we supposed to be cleaning up our lives yes are we supposed to be you know doing a lot of other things the bible includes all kinds of doctrines and things that are very important for us but ultimately our main mission on this earth is to bring other people to christ and, and the, the purpose of the hard preaching and getting the sin out is so that we could do that even better. So that we could be more, um, more usable by God. So that we could have more, uh, people could, could, could trust what we're saying more by, because we're actually 
believing what we say. We're actually walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So people can, can have some, you know, look at that and say, oh, okay, wow, you actually do believe this. And have some credibility with people. Yeah, it all, it all joins together. It all comes together for that main purpose of, of hey, let's, let's compel people to come in that God's house might be full with believers. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that you give us, dear Lord, in your word. I pray that you would please use this church to do many great and mighty works for your name, dear God. It's all to bring glory unto you, dear God, to bring souls unto you, dear God. Help us to go out and seek and save them that are lost. God, we pray for your guidance and we pray that you would please just, just fill our church with boldness and with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.